world is evolving. Evolve ETFs is one of Canada's fastest growing ETF providers and a leader in disruptive innovation, bringing long-term investment themes and many firsts to Canadian investors. EBIT and Ether, providing easy and secure access to the price of Bitcoin and Ether. Tech, exposure to the Fangma stocks. Six technology titans in one ETF. Cars, investing in companies that are making our roads safer and our environment cleaner. Data, companies transitioning to a cloud everything world. Cyber, protecting our data by investing in the good guys. Hero, investing in the growing esports and e-gaming industry. Edge, providing eight innovative trends in one investment solution. These are the growth drivers in the new economy. How are you investing for growth in your portfolio? Evolve ETFs. The world is evolving. Your investment should too. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Evolve July update on cryptocurrencies webinar. My name is Elliot Johnson. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Evolve, uh, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to give you a quick recap on Evolve's business uh, and then dive into an update on Bitcoin and on Ether. Uh, to talk about what's happened in the first half of 2021 and what to look forward to in the second half of the year. Uh, they'll be following that with a Q&A session. So please, if you have questions, um, please do put them into the chat and I'll try to address as many of the questions as possible toward the end of the webinar. Uh, I'd like to start out also by uh, mentioning that today's webinar is for information purposes and uh, investing involves risk, so please do talk to your financial advisor before investing. Um, and uh, please uh, bear in mind that uh, cryptocurrencies have a lot of volatility, so it's particularly important to talk to your financial advisor before investing in cryptocurrencies. Uh, just as a recap and uh, an update to our business, for those of you who have been following us, we've just celebrated uh, three and a half years since we launched our first ETFs in September of 2017. We have reached over $1.7 billion in assets across nine ETF products. And uh, broadly speaking, we have five different categories of funds on our platform. Uh, the category we're best known for is our disruptive innovation suite, uh, where we were first in Canada and in some cases first in the world to bring disruptive tech innovation to customers through an ETF format with our automotive innovation fund, CARS, cybersecurity fund, Cyber, our video game fund, Hero, our cloud computing fund, Data, and our AI fund that encompasses those, as well as some other areas of disruptive innovation, Edge. Recently, we launched Tech, which is an easy way for investors to access the FANGMA ETFs, that's Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Um, and so that's our disruptive tech platform, which I, you also saw in the video at the beginning of this webinar. Um, as mentioned, we're talking about cryptocurrencies today, EBIT for Bitcoin and Ether for Ethereum. Uh, but we also have a number of other products on our shelf, equity income funds, where we use covered call strategies against equities, uh, such as future leadership companies, healthcare, materials and mining, and U.S. banks. We have some actively managed fixed income and cash products, as well as our newly launched series of clean beta ETFs, five and 60 that invest in the S&P 500 and the TSX 60 respectively, but where we neutralize the carbon footprint of those investments by purchasing carbon offsets for those portfolios to allow investors to invest in these core beta strategies that everybody holds, but to do so while recognizing our carbon responsibilities relating to climate change. If you move to the next slide, please, Rachel. Uh, we've been very blessed with some great performance since we launched these products uh, three and a half years ago. Our cybersecurity fund since inception has been one of the best performing ETFs on the Toronto Stock Exchange, recognizing that cybersecurity is a growing concern and a growing area of uh, spend by corporations who continue to need to invest in their defenses against cyber attack. 
Similarly, our Automotive Innovation Fund has had uh, enjoyed great performance since we launched that. This fund invests in the supply chain, as well as the leading automakers who are investing in the future of the car to make it a digital, electric, and autonomous device. Uh, and it's really an industry that's never seen this much change in its history as it has in the past few years and over the years ahead. I mentioned EDGE earlier on, which is our encapsulated uh, fund covering eight different categories of disruptive innovation, where we've also seen some very strong performance because data is changing the world. And I think obviously cryptocurrencies and uh, financial technology is a big part of that. And then finally, uh, Hero, our video game ETF has also seen uh, some strong performance since we launched that two years ago. This fund invests in the video game industry, which um, not everybody knows is the uh, largest form of entertainment in the world, uh, about the same size as music, film, uh, and uh, movies combined. And the video game industry has only seen a bigger uptick in users as a result of our work from home lockdown. Uh, that's a recap of our other products. If you're interested in any of those products, please do visit our website at evolveetfs.com where you'll find more information along with webinars like this that cover those themes as well. Um, but for today, we're here to talk about cryptocurrencies. Uh, Evolve was one of the first ETF providers in the world to launch ETFs in Bitcoin, and we were the first in the world for our Ether ETF uh, this year. This year has seen a huge amount of uh, exciting news in cryptocurrencies, ETFs being a part of that story. And it's been great for us to be part of this uh, conversation as the world has moved to adopt cryptocurrencies more and more. Uh, in fact, Evolve has been involved in cryptocurrencies for a very long time. We were the first issuer in Canada to file for a Bitcoin ETF back in 2017. Unfortunately, it took us several years to get regulatory approval, um, but it just goes to show how far we've come since uh, the cryptocurrency industry started um, and the importance of financial products like ETFs in that story in bringing cryptocurrency investing to the general public. So let's move on to the next slide and just recap what Bitcoin is and why Bitcoin matters to investors. So Bitcoin is uh, the original cryptocurrency uh, created by a man named Sat as a reaction to um, what he saw as some of the flaws with paper currencies. He was trying to find a way to have a digitally scarce asset, an asset where there was only ever going to be so many available and where you could trade it on the internet without people just copying it and, and, and uh, having it um, without uh, having to buy and sell it. And that digital scarcity is why Bitcoin is often known as digital gold. Uh, it's a uh, financial asset where there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin created. Currently, there are 18.7 million Bitcoin in existence. And that scarcity um, means that uh, people are willing to give it the same kind of value that they uh, have for thousands of years given to gold, where uh, it's very scarce and a precious resource. Now, every Bitcoin can be divided into... Um, a million pieces and so you have many bitcoin to go around they're called sats the small portions of bitcoin so there's many many sats to go around um, more than enough for everybody but that limited supply does mean that it is a scarce asset now bitcoin has seen a lot of changes over the course of its uh, time in the world originally it was just something that tech people on the internet knew about but increasingly it has become something that's being recognized as a financial asset if you tune into the financial news, you see people talking about the price of Bitcoin and increasingly regulators, banks, institutional investors and even public companies have grown to recognize the value that Bitcoin has as a store of value, much like gold. And we again saw that this year as the regulators in Canada reached a point where they approved Bitcoin ETFs. And that's really been a transformative event from an adoption perspective. But using Bitcoin itself as cash and as a direct store of value is something we're actually seeing happen more uh, actively in the emerging markets uh, recently with El Salvador, legalizing Bitcoin as legal tender in that country. And that's because it is a hard asset that's available for everybody. As the president of El Salvador said when he uh, announced his plans to make it legal tender, 70% of the people in El Salvador don't have a bank account. 
So these truly are people for whom financial independence and financial um, opportunity comes through the form of a digital asset rather than through El Salvador adopting a traditional banking system like we have here in Canada. And that's because it's a global digital currency. So, you know, one way to think about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is that they are to currencies what email was to the mail system. It's not necessarily going to completely replace existing currencies, but it's a new tool for us to use in the digital age. Bitcoin is completely decentralized. It operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. And that has caused Bitcoin to become uh, a, an interesting asset for folks who are really living online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, alongside all the other things that we do online, whether it be social media or e-commerce, um, digital currencies, we think have now found a place uh, among the innovations that have been brought to us by the internet age. So let's talk about what's happened in 2021 in the first half of the year. If we move to the next slide, you can see that it has been a year characterized by what Bitcoin often does, which is it is a highly, highly volatile asset class. Bitcoin started the year having returned just under 250% in 2020 um, at a price of just over 28,000 US dollars per Bitcoin at the beginning of January. Now, by the 14th of April, the peak in the middle of the chart, Bitcoin had run up by 120% and it's dropped back from that point. It's lost about 45% from that peak and is now for the year up 20%. So again, this is a, an asset that if you hold it as a financial asset, it's probably the most volatile thing in your portfolio. Um, Bitcoin has been known for volatility, um, but you know a lot of people who look at the Bitcoin story say that that's really the result of it being such a young asset with so many new innovations happening um, all the time, causing there to be large swells of movement in one direction or another. Um, but it's definitely something that investors need to bear in mind. Now, it is more than just a, a story of a price chart, for sure. There's been a huge number of news events in the first half of this year for Bitcoin. Um, I, I think the most notable early news events for Bitcoin was the adoption of Bitcoin by large corporations as something that they hold on their balance sheet instead of cash. Tesla made an announcement on the 8th of February that it had bought one and a half billion US dollars worth of Bitcoin and would accept Bitcoin as a payment method for cars going forward. This was a watershed event for a lot of investors who maybe up to that point had been thinking of Bitcoin as something that they didn't really have to pay attention to. And the reason for that is because Tesla is in the S&P 500 and other indices and is a widely held company. And once Tesla bought Bitcoin, now a lot of investors held Bitcoin through owning Tesla shares. And that caused a lot of investors, particularly large institutions, to, to take a very serious look at Bitcoin and try to figure out uh, how they would use it. How do they think of digital gold in their portfolios? Now, MicroStrategy, which is um, another tech company, uh, sold some bonds at the end of February to buy more Bitcoin. They had previously bought Bitcoin onto their balance sheet last year. Uh, and Tesla was uh, following their lead to some degree. But the real watershed moment for investors in terms of owning Bitcoin came uh, at the end of February with the launch of EBIT, the Bitcoin ETF, so that investors can now hold Bitcoin in their bank account, in their brokerage account, alongside any other assets, stocks, bonds, or other ETFs. This is a really a democratizing event for Bitcoin ownership because you can hold Bitcoin through these ETFs in a registered account, you can use Bitcoin in investment strategies where you might have rebalancing activities where you want to hold it alongside other assets. Uh, it really opened the door to more widespread ownership for investors who didn't want to have to deal with the technicalities of creating a digital wallet on the Bitcoin blockchain and buying and selling Bitcoin directly. Bitcoin can now be held much like gold ETFs allow investors to hold gold in their brokerage account. Bitcoin ETF now allows investors to hold Bitcoin in their brokerage account. The corporate story continued through the end of February. Square, a large financial technology firm run by Jack Dorsey, who was the founder of Twitter, announced that they had bought some Bitcoin into their treasury as well. Uh, and that was really the story of the first quarter. Corporate adoption as well as financial and regulatory adoption through ETFs. Now, the drawdown that's happened since then has shown how Bitcoin also uh, often has to suffer through um, negative news and, and volatile news cycles. 
Um, so while MicroStrategy borrowed more money to increase their holding to almost $2 billion at the end of April, in the middle of May, Elon Musk decided to suspend Bitcoin purchases because of concerns around energy uh, use of the Bitcoin network. And we'll get to that in a moment because I think it's an important concern that's had a lot of news this year. Uh, and then at the end of May, China began a series of measures to ban cryptocurrency mining. And we've seen that take place since the end of May all the way through to the end of June as large miners who mine cryptocurrency have moved their servers out of China to other locations, the US, Russia, and other parts of the world. And you've seen a complete transformation in where Bitcoin is mined. Prior to the Chinese mining ban, more than half, half of Bitcoin miners were in China. Uh, because they were able to access a large amount of low cost clean power in that country um, but the uh, chinese regime wanted to have control over their economy as we know they do and so they have banned mining and those miners have moved the interesting thing to note there though is that the bitcoin network didn't skip a beat if you owned bitcoin or you were using bitcoin these banning of bitcoin in china uh, didn't change the ability for you to use the currency um, Bitcoin, uh, as some people say, is beyond the control of any government. And I think we've seen that recently with this news out of China. Now, uh, as far as uh, nation state news goes, um, there was a lot of excitement in the Bitcoin community where at the Bitcoin conference in Miami on the 9th of June, the president of El Salvador announced he was making Bitcoin legal tender. And that has now started a whole bunch of excitement around other countries potentially making Bitcoin legal tender. So. I hope this uh, demonstrates the ups and downs of both the Bitcoin price as well as the Bitcoin news cycle. Uh, it still remains very much a new technology um, and uh, it still remains very much the case that there are multiple points of view, multiple opinions on whether it is good or it's bad. Uh, and investors need to bear that in mind when considering whether to find a place for Bitcoin in their portfolio. Now, if we move to the next slide, let's spend a moment talking about the concerns around Bitcoin's energy consumption, because this was raised by Elon Musk um, when he decided to stop uh, accepting purchases of Tesla cars in Bitcoin. Um, and there have been people who said, you know, why would he do that? You know, he, he, he announced he was holding it and accepting it. And then a month later, he changed his mind. Um, and the nearest explanation that we've been able to find is that because Tesla make so much money off carbon credits. Um, there was some concern that the fear about the Bitcoin network's energy usage might cause that portion of the Tesla business um, to be at risk. And therefore, Elon Musk decided he needed to stop accepting it while he evaluated the situation in more detail. So the question obviously is uh, around Bitcoin's energy usage. Is it really a significant contributor to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. And I think it's important to put the Bitcoin network into context. Um, it's been vastly overstated. A lot of people who have cited stats around Bitcoin's energy usage have taken the total amount of Bitcoin energy and said, therefore, all of this energy must be uh, causing emissions and climate change. But in fact, 76% of crypto miners rely on some degree of renewable energy. Um, and almost 40% of the Bitcoin network's energy use was in the form of renewables over the past year. So it uses less energy than other uh, internet technologies. It's only 40% of uh, the energy used by all of the other data centers around the world. Um, and in a lot of cases, Bitcoin's energy consumption actually is even cleaner than some of these stats indicate because miners tend to locate their Bitcoin equipment near to places where energy is cheap and readily available. And in fact, the electricity supply of the world is not something that is um, uniformly distributed. And in a lot of cases, you have excess electricity created at a plant where it is not necessarily transmitted to industry and customers for use and can go to waste. And a lot of Bitcoin miners have set up shop in places where they can buy at low cost that excess electricity um, that was not being used. And in particular, we see this around uh, hydroelectric power where uh, they tend to get overbuilt to begin with because they're building for the future and they're creating an energy that's not being used at all. Bitcoin mining can make efficient use of that energy. And so 
really, I think the story here is that there's there's two sides to every argument. Uh, is Bitcoin a perfectly clean network? No, it isn't. No electricity uh, production in the world is perfectly clean. But uh, I think Bitcoin has been singled out for criticism around its energy use in a way that pretty much no other electric electricity consuming technology in our lives gets singled out. And there's been a huge amount of focus put on it. And as a result, a lot of Bitcoin miners are redoubling their efforts to use uh, clean and renewable energy. Uh, and some of the miners in Canada, for example, um, that I'm aware of are, are um, you know, deliberately building out wind farms and other forms of renewable energy, which stimulates, of course, the renewable energy sector. So again, two sides to every argument, um, but uh, Bitcoin's energy consumption is something that we'll continue to be keeping an eye on and providing you with updates on as time goes by. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the biggest changes and, and developments around uh, legitimization and adoption of Bitcoin over the year to date has been really the adoption by big name global banks uh, and asset management companies in terms of providing services for their clients. And you can see here a list of some of the biggest banks in the world and the different products and services they're doing. Uh, relating to cryptocurrencies. This is just one snapshot. You can find a lot of stories around adoption in uh, uh, many other jurisdictions. As I've mentioned, obviously in Canada, we have Bitcoin ETFs. Those ETFs are supported by Canadian dealers who trade ETFs. And so our financial system in Canada has taken some steps towards supporting cryptocurrencies this year. And we continue to see this trend progressing in this direction. We see a lot more signs of further adoption by various institutions and regulators down the track um, as they uh, have seen that uh, products like Bitcoin ETFs have been working uh, quite well for investors. So let's look at what's up ahead this year and, and some of the challenges that Bitcoin has to face as well as some of the opportunities. As I mentioned, energy concerns continue to be a challenge, um, but I think a healthy one for the industry to have to face that and, um, and, and find solutions so that um, Bitcoin can be not just a financially liberating technology, but also one that is aligned with uh, people's values today around carbon emissions and climate change. Regulatory hurdles continue to be a challenge. You know, one of the biggest questions that we get from investors is when is the US gonna have a Bitcoin ETF? And of course, we don't know what, they, uh, what their plans are at the SEC. But there's no question that it's the regulatory hurdle in the U.S. that is so far still held the door closed to an ETF in the U.S. But we have since launching our Bitcoin ETF in Canada, seen Bitcoin ETFs in other countries in the world. Brazil has one now. And there uh, is news coming out of Australia that they're very close to having a Bitcoin ETF as well. And so while once again, Canada leads the way when it comes to exchange traded funds, just like we did in 1990 when the first ETF was created in Canada, um, we're not going to be alone for long as other countries come along towards having Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency ETFs. But to get there, regulators need to get comfortable with how cryptocurrencies work. And there's a huge amount of regulatory innovation and development that goes into that. Um, but we believe there, is a lot of, there are a lot of people, both regulators and issuers and investors around the world who are working on those challenges. Similarly to that, we have legal challenges in various countries. China's um, concerns around uh, Bitcoin mining being a great example of a legal challenge. Uh, will China maintain that position indefinitely? We don't know, um, but it's a good example of a country who changed its laws um, for political reasons. And then I think the, the biggest challenge to Bitcoin uh, that everybody recognizes every time they think about the subject is the price volatility. The volatility of this asset, it's a 100 vol asset, roughly speaking, that is a, a, uh, a real hindrance to adoption for many people's portfolios. Um, it's as a result of that, you know, most of the investors that we're talking to are talking about having a very small size of exposure if they're having exposure because the volatility is so much that they, they can't uh, have larger exposure than um, a very small size. Uh, and it, it does shut the door to some investors entirely. So. We think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally will need to move through this period of volatility to more stable uh, price moves uh, in order to have much more widespread adoption. But on the other hand, there are a lot of opportunities. 
uh, with Bitcoin uh, coming up, we continue to see, you know, the as I mentioned already, these various steps every month, there's some step towards incremental adoption by a new entity, whether it's an asset manager or a corporation or a country or a regulator. And, you know, uh, a journey is made up of uh, many, many steps, and we're continuing to see that happen. And each of those steps in and of itself is not enough to get there. But after a while, you look back and you see how far you've come. Nation state adoption. Uh, this is the other side of the coin to legal challenges. El Salvador uh, has made Bitcoin legal tender on par with the US dollar, which it was using before. And there have been many other politicians in Latin America in particular who have been talking about following suit with El Salvador, as well as some other countries in the world. We think that the legal um, nation state adoption is going to be something that starts with the emerging markets, uh, principally because they don't have existing currencies that are reliable um, and, and well regarded. We're astonishingly lucky to live in Canada where we um, have a great currency and a very stable government to take care of that currency for us. And so Canadians don't generally mistrust their currency, um, but not everybody lives there. In some countries, there's uh, quite serious hyperinflation. And so a hard asset currency is highly attractive. And we think we'll see more news coming out of that in the months ahead. Um, and then the other big opportunity, as we've seen through the sell-off um, since the early part of May, is that uh, when you look at who is buying and who is selling, there are large long-term holders of Bitcoin, uh, wallets that have held Bitcoin for many, many years who continue to hold. They're not selling, and if anything, they've been buying. And that shows a, a strong commitment from uh, the core Bitcoin investors who have been through ups and downs before, who've been through the bull market of 2017 and through the crash that followed and have continued to go through the ups and downs this year as well. And so um, that's an opportunity for uh, resilience when you see investors do that. Um, so just to move to the next slide to uh, um, cap off the um, EBIT ETF for you, we have two classes. We have EBIT, which is in Canadian dollars and EBIT.U, which is in US dollars. These are ETFs that trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. You can hold them in a registered plan, RSP, a TFSA. You can hold them in your brokerage account. They trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange, so you can buy and sell them every day. Um, there are options that trade against these ETFs on the Montreal Exchange if you are interested in options trading. Uh, and we offer the uh, two classes of this fund for a management fee of 75 basis points. So uh, that's how investors can access Bitcoin in a brokerage account through our ETF. Changing subjects, let's talk now about Ethereum, oftentimes viewed as Bitcoin's cousin. Uh, it is probably the second best known cryptocurrency out there um, with the most adoption outside of Bitcoin, but it's a very different technology. So there are similarities to Bitcoin. The Ethereum network is a global network, 24-7, 365, uh, and decentralized. And in that way, it is very similar to Bitcoin. It is a global cryptocurrency. But the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin really comes out of what Ethereum was designed to do. So the folks who created Ethereum started by looking at Bitcoin and saying to themselves, well, you know, if we come up with a way of running a blockchain and running a currency on it, maybe we can have more features than just buying and selling the token itself. And so Ethereum is a programmable technology. This is a software that runs on this global network that can do things based on the code that you write to run on top of Ethereum. And that has made it the building block for an explosion in digital finance, often referred to as decentralized finance or DeFi. And this is an area of the cryptocurrency industry where we are seeing an enormous amount of innovation and development. There are more developers working on apps in DeFi than there are working on apps for the Linux, Unix operating system that is used uh, by most cloud servers. Um, there is an enormous amount of early stage development and applications that are now available on DeFi that has got a lot of people excited about seeing the traditional financial services industry being uh, recreated online in a way that provides access beyond nation state borders and to a full global community with the kinds of services that traditionally 
we saw only being offered by banks or stock exchanges. Now it's happening online. So let's move to the next slide and talk a little bit about some of the categories of these uh, technologies that are being built on DeFi. So uh, roughly speaking right now, there are sort of four main categories that uh, you can find in terms of DeFi apps. Um, there, these roughly map back to um, existing parts of our financial infrastructure today, the credit market, the bond market, uh, the foreign exchange market where you buy and sell currencies, uh, derivatives market like futures and options, and then um, the art market, the collectibles market as well. So to pick each one of these in turn, um, in the credit market, you know, to, to today, if you want to borrow money, you'll go to a bank, they'll give you a loan. Um, or if you're a company, you'll sell bonds and investors will buy your bonds. Well, on DeFi, there are a number of decentralized apps. One of the best known ones is an app called Compound, which allow individual users on the internet, on the Ethereum blockchain to meet at the Compound app and exchange value back and forth to one another. So I could take some Ether if I own some Ether and I could lend it to somebody else by putting it onto Compound where the borrower comes and they borrow it from me. Now they have to post collateral and all the rules around the loan are in that programmable smart contract. So I, as the lender, can feel confident that I will be repaid because the rules are encapsulated in code. Um, but the borrower can borrow money, um, borrow digital money online and, uh, and take it off and, and do what they need to do with it and, and repay it later, just like a credit market. In terms of foreign exchange, Obviously, there are many, many cryptocurrencies out there. So to be able to swap one for another, if I own Bitcoin and I want to buy Ether, I want to be able to uh, do that trade. Now, many people, I would say probably most people today would do it through an exchange, an exchange like Coinbase, for example, that is a well-known uh, crypto exchange that went public this year. Um, but you could also do it through a uh, DeFi app, uh, like for example, Uniswap is one of those apps where you can uh, swap your one crypto for another one. And so this has become a way in which you can decentralize that uh, mechanism of exchanging cryptocurrencies one for another. And again, there are two sides to that trade. You've got the folks who are, who are posting their currency as a part of that uh, Uniswap service and getting paid some yield for posting that currency. And then you've got folks who are coming in to uh, swap one currency for another. Uh, synthetics is an exciting area of the derivatives market. In fact, the derivatives market has really exploded online um, because of the way in which smart contracts lend themselves to derivatives trading. And this can take the form of futures, it can take the form of options, um, it can take the form of swaps. There are any number of different forms of derivatives that, you know, in the traditional financial services world, there are only a few exchanges where you can go to trade futures or options. Um, and uh, they are fairly specialized products, but online you can access these through these apps that you can run on your phone. So if you want to um, have leverage, you wanna, you wanna you know, uh, risk more than uh, just your cash amount to speculate on the price of currencies, you can do that through the derivatives market. And it's seen a, a huge amount of growth, and, and some people I think rightly so do uh, accuse the futures market uh, in, uh, in crypto of being one of the reasons why it has been uh, more volatile lately. Uh, so it remains to be seen exactly how that plays out. But you know, unlike other derivatives markets in traditional finance, these are programmatic contracts. So they close themselves out when they are no longer funded with the appropriate amount of margin. And so there's no systemic risk in the way that we saw in the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Um, and so we've seen growth and shrinking of the derivatives market, and yet the cryptocurrencies themselves have continued on uh, without any trouble. And then finally, maybe the most interesting of uh, applications currently on DeFi is this notion of uh, something called NFTs, which stands for non-fungible tokens. And this is where you can own the rights to a piece of art or um, uh, some kind of rare thing that only will belong to you when you buy the NFT. And so there are a couple of big examples of this. One is a digital artist uh, uh, known as Beeple sold a piece of artwork for $69 million in March um, on uh, the uh, NFT market. And that was really, that's the biggest NFT to sell so far. So that means that the person who bought it had to take $69 million of cash and buy ether with it and use that ether 
to buy this NFT. And in that sense, you can see how Ether is a required commodity because all of these things we see in DeFi are using Ether as their um, the, the currency by which they operate. Um, perhaps more accessible to lots of folks is NBA, the National Basketball Association uh, launched NBA Top Shot back uh, earlier this year where you can buy um, the rights to own the video of your favorite basketball move. And so you see folks buying, you know, you, you might watch a basketball game, you see a dunk that you really like, it's available through NBA Top Shot. You can buy that NFT and then you can tell your friends, you know, I own that LeBron James dunk from that game that I saw. Nobody else gets to have it. It's mine and it's a collectible. It's something that you can you can hold and, and, and show people. Uh, and then the there's a big opportunity within NFTs, particularly as it relates to video games. Uh, Epic Games, uh, Fortnite has announced that they're going to offer the ability to trade the uh, things that characters can use in that game through the NFT market. And this is something that we think is going to be uh, a growth area because of the overall growth of video games, the ability to develop items within a game for your character and sell it to somebody else really brings the notion of a uh, an, an economy and a marketplace to the video game industry, which is uh, growing very rapidly as well. One of the ways in which you, you look at the um, amount of value in DeFi is how much total value is locked in DeFi. These numbers here from April this year it reached a, a high of almost $60 billion US at the peak of the market. Um, and that is the amount of Ether that's essentially on deposit at each of these programs um, at the current price of Ether. So uh, DeFi is still a place where we continue to look for, for, for news within the Ethereum ecosystem. If we move to the next uh, slide, you can see that total value locked here as well uh, on this chart. Uh, right now, the total value locked in, in um, the Ethereum ecosystem in DeFi is 56 billion US dollars. And you can see here the top 10 projects and how much they have in terms of value locked. So the way to think of total value locked is think of it as the deposit base for a bank. When you look at a bank uh, and you say, well, how much does it have in terms of retail deposits? That's a sense of the strength of the bank because those deposits from retail customers are what is used by the bank to then lend money out to corporations or fund various other activities, whether it's trading activities or underwriting activities for companies that are going public and what have you. So the value locked in each of these projects is a little bit like the uh, retail deposits of each of these projects. And so as you start to see this number up in the billions of dollars for some of the larger projects, you can see that this is something that's more than just a uh, technology experiment. You've got a lot of people with a lot of value that they are um, putting into these platforms because they believe in them and they believe that their uh, future, um, there's a future for a lot of growth there as the financial industry is reimagined online. Right now, 7.5% of total Ether outstanding is locked in these applications on DeFi. So uh, if we move to the next slide, we can just look back a little bit at the uh, year we've had so far. Again, much like with Bitcoin, we've seen an enormous amount of volatility in the value of Ether. Last year, Ether had a return of 467%. And from January 1st to its peak in May, it uh, rose by another 490%. But since then, it's dropped by 50%, 51% to where we are at the end of June. So again, a very highly volatile asset class with large ups and large downs and lots of news along the way. I mentioned the uh, LeBron James NFT that sold 22nd of February for $208,000 on NBA Top Shot. So that gives a sense of, of what people are willing to pay for some of the uh, these NFTs, these digital collectibles. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Beeple NFT there, uh, it was named Everydays, sold for $69 million at a Christie's auction that was then settled on uh, the Ethereum blockchain uh, with Ether. Uh, the big milestone, of course, in terms of industry adoption and regulatory reform came on the 20th of April when we launched Ether, which is our Ether ETF on the TSX, the first Ether ETF in the world. And for the first time on the 20th of April this year, investors could own Ether within their brokerage account, and use it within their investment strategies without having to go to a cryptocurrency exchange and buy it and hold their wallet keys and all those other things. Uh, that was followed a few weeks later by an announcement from uh, billionaire Mark Cuban that 
he thinks Ether is the most interesting part of the cryptocurrency world. He's obviously a very influential uh, public figure in the investment space. And so there, there are, by the way, hundreds of other events that happened within individual DeFi projects uh, through the course of this year. And Ether itself has also experienced uh, some upgrades along the way. Uh, unlike the Bitcoin blockchain, where the code is pretty much set in stone, the Ethereum community does upgrades to their um, their network over time through a community of developers that are surrounding that. Um, and we saw one of those upgrades earlier this year, the Berlin upgrade, that's really laid the foundation for Ethereum 2.0, um, which we can talk about as we as we look ahead. Uh, perhaps we can go to the next slide and look at some of the challenges and opportunities facing Ethereum through the remainder of the year and in the year to come. Um, so probably the biggest single challenge I would say in front of the Ethereum community right now is the Ethereum 2.0 upgrade. So Ethereum 2.0 is a change in how the blockchain works. So right now with Ethereum, uh, it uses a form of mining known as proof of work. And this is a form of mining that, you know, as we mentioned with Bitcoin and their energy consumption, um, it requires computers to prove that they've solved a very difficult cryptographic problem and it consumes a lot of energy. Ethereum with the 2.0 upgrade is going to move to something called proof of stake, where the computers that are creating the blockchain and putting those new blocks on the blockchain only get to participate if they prove that they have a certain amount of Ethereum that they themselves are holding. And then there are penalties if they don't do what they're supposed to do. They can actually have some of that Ethereum deleted from their account in a process known as slashing. That means that the Ethereum network is going to become a lot greener after the 2.0 upgrade because it no longer will be a matter of a competing network of computers consuming lots of energy to participate in the, in the network. It will be more a matter of it being secured by lots of computers that have a stake in the success of the system. So that's one of the big upgrades coming for Ethereum 2.0. The second one, which is maybe even more exciting, is that it's including uh, a, a, a system for scaling the network called sharding, where the network is going to become 64 times bigger in terms of its capacity. This is going to allow a much larger amount of throughput on the Ethereum blockchain, which allows these DeFi applications to do a lot more faster and support the growth of DeFi and the growth of Ethereum going forward. Obviously, this network needs to scale to be uh, very, very large in order to do all the things that people are trying to do on it, much like the internet scales up and, and you know, the, the internet service that you had 15 years ago where you had dial-up internet would no longer be okay today where we need much faster connections and much more processing power and much more storage power. And the Ethereum folks are really working on scalability through sharding as well. Um, and then the final challenge coming up this year is the implementation of the Ethereum improvement proposal number 1559, which has become a very, very big deal in the Ethereum community. And this is a proposal that will cause the way in which you get charged for a new block to change. Today, the new block um, is paid for and the money goes to the, com the computer that's mining it and then the blockchain creates some more ether to reward that computer that was mining it. But with the implementation of this improvement, some of that fee actually gets deleted, which stops the inflation of the amount of Ethereum outstanding from getting too big as the network grows. In fact, it could even become a deflationary asset, which makes it very attractive for folks who currently look at Bitcoin and say, well, I like it because it's scarce. I like it because they're not making more of it. And uh, but with Ether, well, Ether, they could just keep making more and more Ether. So I don't have that property of, of store of value. This is to bring the property of store of value to Ether investors, because as the network grows, that does not mean that the amount of Ether outstanding is going to grow and explode and run away and, and become a very inflationary. If anything, it could actually become deflationary and we could have less Ether as some of it gets burned for use. This is why some people talk about Bitcoin as digital gold and Ether as digital oil as a consumable asset. So those are some of the technical hurdles. There's a great deal of interest on this. And, and for folks who are technically inclined, um, it's a lot of fun to follow the developments in the Ethereum community. 
um, and you can really spend a lot of time looking into the technical details of these upgrades. But needless to say, it's a thriving community. This is the kind of stuff you would expect to see from early stage venture technology companies in terms of you know, starting with a minimum viable product and then releasing new upgrades all the time, as we see oftentimes from new technology products that come out of Silicon Valley. Uh, Ether has the regulatory challenges, much like Bitcoin in front of it, and legal framework challenges around, particularly these DeFi projects. A lot of these DeFi projects live in a little bit of legal limbo online, and it's not always clear to what extent they fall under the legal framework of any particular country. A lot of that still needs to get worked out. Um, and we see, you know, moves in that direction on a fairly ongoing basis as these companies become bigger and need to um, make sure that they are within the rules of the various different countries in which they operate. And then I would say kind of the, the final big challenge to Ethereum is that its correlation to the price of Bitcoin continues to be very high. It may run up and drop back in larger or smaller amounts of Bitcoin, but you will have noticed from those two different price charts, one of Bitcoin, one of Ether, that their shape of them looks roughly the same. And the cryptocurrency community and the price of cryptocurrencies continues to be correlated to each other quite tightly. It's uncorrelated to other assets like bonds, real estate, or stocks. But within crypto, if Bitcoin is moving up, oftentimes Ether is moving up and, and vice versa as well. And so we haven't seen these assets reflect really, truly independent price movement yet. And we think we're going to need to see more of that for investors to consider how to use them separately and take advantage of the various opportunities that they present that are a little bit different from each other. Uh, I mentioned in the challenges also some of the opportunities, the upgrade and the, 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 the benefits of the upgrade. Obviously with proof of stake, the other value coming from proof of stake as well as for locking up your ether on DeFi is that you can generate yield on it as well, which makes ether an interesting asset in that it's a store of value that can also generate yield if you put it on deposit within these DeFi projects or uh, as a staking, uh, as part of a mining pool for, for the ether network itself. Um, last summer, we saw what was uh, later referred to as DeFi summer, and we think that maybe we're in the middle of DeFi summer part two this year, where you see a huge number of projects on the uh, Ethereum blockchain being developed in the DeFi space. And, and again, more and more movement towards adoption. We continue to see that even with the recent drawdown in the price of Bitcoin and Ether, we've actually seen adoption on DeFi stay stable and, and in some cases even move up. And that's because more and more people are realizing it's easier and easier to get access to these projects and to use this technology. And then another big opportunity here, of course, is institutional adoption uh, and investor adoption generally. In our conversations with large investors, we tend to uh, get a lot of feedback from them saying that they look at Ethereum in the way they look at venture capital investing. This is like early stage VC investing in the tech space. Um, they tend to be comfortable doing that. So they kind of use that as their lens for thinking about Ethereum. And so again, Bitcoin is sort of, you think about it in the way that you might think about investing in gold and Ethereum perhaps the way you might think about investing in early stage tech companies. So moving on to the next slide, just to give you a little bit of an overview of how our ETFs work. We are holding actual physical Bitcoin and Ether in our ETFs. So when you purchase units of the ETFs on the TSX, the dealer, whether it's one of the Canadian banks or one of the independent dealers here that sells you that unit is going to come into one of our funds and say, I need to create more units. And the dealer provides cash to the fund. We then take that cash and we go out and we buy Bitcoin or Ether, depending on the fund that we're using. We are using best in class service providers. Every service provider in our products is regulated within the local jurisdiction in Canada or in the US where they're operating and uh, is audited. We have best in class service providers um, who uh, are frequently audited and made sure that they're operating in terms of best practices. So when you buy EBIT or you buy Ether, you can feel confident that you are owning effectively Bitcoin or Ether, because these funds only own the currency, their respective cryptocurrency, and that the entire structure is being provided by best-in-class institutions that you trust for any other ETF that you might be looking at buying um, just the same way. So it really, we're trying to take the worry away from investors in terms of being able to access 
these cryptocurrencies in your brokerage account. So if we move along to the next slide, just as a summary to recap uh, our products, we have two classes for each fund, EBIT and EBIT.U, Ether and Ether.U, whether you want it in Canadian dollars or US dollars, they trade daily on the Toronto Stock Exchange. You can hold them in your brokerage account. You can hold them in your registered account, your RRSP or your TFSA. Um, it makes owning cryptocurrencies much easier for investors um, and allows you to have a conversation with your financial advisor about whether to invest in cryptocurrencies and be able to do so within the full framework of your overall portfolio that um, you're managing. And so with that, I will uh, look at what questions we have here. Um, I have one question here. DeFi on Ethereum sounds very exciting. How does the value accrue to the Ether asset from DeFi? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think the framework that people are thinking about Ether in relation to DeFi is that because the DeFi projects require Ether to trade, the demand for Ether will go up as those projects become bigger and bigger. So let's take NFTs, for example. If you want to go out and buy an NFT from NBA Top Shot, you would have to go and buy Ether to go and buy that NFT. So if lots of people are buying collectibles that trade on the NFT markets, they're buying Ether to buy those collectibles, and that causes more demand for that asset. And so it is a way in which the growth of DeFi will result in the utility of Ethereum and uh, the Ether asset itself to become more valuable. And the other way, of course, is that with EIP-1559 and the burning of fees when transactions happen on the blockchain, when you buy that NFT that is held on the Ethereum blockchain for you, just for you, uh, to make that into the next block on the blockchain, that mining transaction will cause a small amount of Ethereum to be deleted. And as that Ether is deleted, uh, there's less Ether available, which means that Ether itself becomes more scarce and that would also affect the value. So these things are very much interlinked. Um, one way some people think about Ether is they think about it as the sort of worldwide web of uh, cryptocurrency finance on top of which web pages are gonna get built and the web itself is very valuable. So that's another way to think about it as well. Uh, and I have, I think, time for one more question here. What was the reason for the sell-off in Ether this year? Was it a tweet from Elon Musk? So um, we find that oftentimes it's difficult to cite a particular news event that causes a movement in the price of cryptocurrencies. There's so much volatility, it's very hard to put these two things together. There's no question that Elon Musk saying he was not going to accept Bitcoin anymore seemed to mark kind of the top of the Bitcoin market. And Ether sold off as well. And I think that also comes back to the second point, which is that these two cryptocurrencies are highly correlated. They may not go up the same amount as each other, but they do tend to run in the same general direction most of the time. And so um, we can't really cite one particular news item as the reason for the start of a bull run or the start of a bear run within the asset class. Uh, but we do know that they tend to run in sync. Um, and so we think that sentiment is highly aligned between these um, different cryptocurrencies. And uh, there's so much news happening in the crypto space every day. Sometimes it's hard to pick what caused one thing to move or another thing to move. Um, but there's no question that uh, it's um, likely if you own Bitcoin and you own Ether, you're going to have some similarities in terms of your uh, investment returns as well. So to leave it there, I, I'd just like to mention that we have a lot of other information on our website. We have newsletters, videos, monthly fact sheets and product sheets. We also have a series of podcasts and webinars just like this one as well. Uh, so if you'd like more information about any of our funds, whether it be EBIT and Ether or any of the other products that I talked about up front, please do go to our website and have a look there. Um, we'd be happy to uh, also provide you with any further information if you want to reach out to us with any questions. So with that, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us and thank you for joining our July 
cryptocurrency webinar update.